we have another amazing panel. We've been so fortunate uh, to continue our conversation really about how we build the equity uh, in this amazing uh, community. And so uh, with that, it's my pleasure to turn the conversation over to Jean Axius, uh, who's the Senior Vice President for Global Thought Leadership at ARP and really has been an amazing uh, advocate for equity and inclusion across the ARP uh, platform and organization, also working uh, on building uh, partnerships, unique partnerships with private sector actors, um, not only in our country, but across the, the globe to promote longevity and equity. So with that, Gene, thanks so much for being here and I'll kick it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Rhett, uh, and good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, depending on where you are. That was such an amazing panel uh, that just preceded us. Uh, thank you so much, Felicia. I am thrilled to be moderating a distinguished panel uh, with some amazing thought leaders and experts to really think about what are the solutions to really build equity uh, into our entrepreneurship community uh, population, particularly for those over the age of 50. Uh, as Felicia and Susan and others have talked about earlier uh, throughout our session uh, today, uh, a focus on equity is critically important for AARP, uh, really addressing the issues of both health and wealth and the intersections to ensure that people can live a stronger, healthier, more productive life. As we think about entrepreneurship, it is critical uh, as a pathway for addressing many of the wealth gaps that we actually see. Uh, and I think that this panel and this conversation that we've had today is really elevating some solutions, some insights in terms of exactly how we move forward. Uh, I am uh, extremely honored uh, to be able to welcome to the main stage, Julicia Colliallo, who's the co-founder of the Maestro Entrepreneur Center, uh, where she works and collaborates with multiple stakeholders to foster economic growth in the poorest zip codes of uh, San Antonio, Texas. She also served as the co-lead of the mayor's economic transition team during COVID-19 to help local businesses impacted by the pandemic. Uh, joining Julio is uh, Mark Madrid. Uh, Mark is the Associate Administrator for the Office of Entrepreneurial Development at the Small Business Administration. He serves as the Executive Director for the Latino Business Action Network where he works to expand Latino research and education impact programs at Stanford University, which is one of my alma maters. Uh, we also have uh, Chris Wheat, uh, who's joining us today. Chris is the co-president at JP Morgan Chase Institute. Uh, he previously taught as an assistant professor at MIT Solon School of Management and the Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development at Rutgers Business School. And then finally, we have Mark Morreale, who serves as the president and CEO of the National Urban League since 2003, where he has created a framework in terms of generation policies that support community color, um, including, uh, as I refer to the entrepreneur centers in five cities to help the growth of small businesses. Uh, from 1994 to 2002, uh, Mark served as the mayor of New Orleans, where he leveraged a broad multiracial coalition and just did amazing innovative programs and policies. Welcome everyone. How's everybody doing today? It is so thank you. It's so good to see all of you. I'm going to just start off uh, just kind of picking up where we left off with the previous panel. I thought it was extremely powerful what Tawanda said in terms of this is an opportunity to reset, to reimagine, to rebuild. And when we look back over the last year, and as we think about the devastating impact of the pandemic, particularly on minority owned firms, women-owned firms, what have been some of the lessons you've learned? How do you think we got here in terms of some of the disproportionate impacts on this population as the report from the New York Feds and AARP showed? And how do you think we might move forward? So I'm gonna start with you, Felicia, if you don't mind just kind of letting us know, you know, what are some of the key lessons you learned from this pandemic, particularly as it relates to the impact on the pandemic uh, and the impact on uh, small businesses how did we get here? And more importantly, how can we move forward? Um, thank you, Jean, for having me. I think um, what, was, what was interesting to me was the panel right before this, right? You had the business owners speaking on the experiences and the challenges. And that is the reason why we need to continue having these conversations, right? The reason we're here today, when the pandemic hit, um, we immediately saw that the issues um, with equity were being magnified. Immediately, they were the biggest uh, obstacles that, or the biggest uh, at-risk companies, right? They were the ones, 50% were going to go out of business in five years before pandemic, during pandemic, 
five months. It was going to go quick, right? And so having the 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 fact that the level playing field is not a level playing field for small business. The small businesses are considered high risk. They pay highest interest. They pay highest insurance rate. They pay highest on materials. They pay highest on everything, right? Um, so having any type of programs that are going to help them reduce that so that they do have some kind of advantage is so needed. But most of the time, that has never been the trends. If you look at 10 years ago, it wasn't there. You look at 10 years prior to that, it wasn't there. You look at the issue nationwide, it's exactly the same. The small businesses are not growing because there's way too many barriers keeping them from growing. And so this conversation is about equity. We should be talking about what are the things we need to change to make sure that we're addressing one at a time, right? And business owners, just like they said in the panel earlier, I think Kim Hunter said it, they are going to lift each other up because they want to be successful and they want their neighbors to be successful. They are in business because they care about their neighborhoods. They care about the people they hire and they're going to do everything and anything to get there. They just need someone to open the doors and let them in without saying, you can only come in if you have these things. Mm -hmm. That's where we go wrong. And Mark Morial, you're president and CEO of the National Urban League. Can you say a little bit more in terms of exactly what have been some of the lessons learned and what are some of the uh, insights uh, that you're looking forward to as an organization to really kind of help it to lead us uh, moving forward? Let me, first of all, just say thank you for the conversation and for the focus and uh, for the great panelists who uh, I think uh, offering so many great suggestions. Uh, we've learned over the last uh, 15 years uh, since the National Urban League made a big move to support small businesses with now 12 entrepreneurship centers serving some 13 to 14,000 small businesses. 90% of them are African American owned and some 50 to 55% are women owned that it gets down to number one capital. Number two connections. Number three contracts. Number four, customers. And I put capital first because uh, in, in, in being a former entrepreneur and in witnessing the entrepreneurs that we serve, you're never going to find more energy, more desire, more uh, uh, scrappiness, more intuition, more, uh, if you will, just basic human talent. Entrepreneurship requires passion. Uh, and what we've learned is that that passion has not been matched uh, by the marketplace of America, the financial marketplace of America, with access to both equity and debt. And so, so many small business owners, of course, 90% of Black small business owners uh, are the chief cook, bottle washer, CFO, uh, building director, custodian, all wrapped in one has not been matched. And statistics show that these small businesses uh, are growing at a faster clip than many of the larger businesses in the country, looking at it on a percentage basis. And that in black America, in uh, uh, Latinx America, in Asian America, in, if you will, among women, the desire for self-employment and entrepreneurship is high, it's strong. And America must understand that to invest in our small businesses is to promote economic growth. Now I'm excited that the Biden administration, I think has taken up this mantle some of the changes they made to the flawed PPP program are most noted. Uh, some of the new resources uh, included and new initiatives included in the American Rescue Plan, I think are also important down payments, uh, if you will. And I think uh, there will be even a greater opportunity for the Biden administration and this Congress to lead the way uh, with a passage of an infrastructure and jobs bill that addresses many of the things that we're talking about, addresses 
access to capital, uh, a commitment and an insurance that uh, African-American owned businesses and small businesses have an opportunity to participate uh, in any growth strategy, any growth formula. So uh, we've learned a, a great deal. And, and, and I learned, you know, and I, that's my final thought. When I served as mayor of New Orleans, had a ex very aggressive program. We called it our Emerging Business Program. And it was focused on African-American and women-owned uh, firms. And we were, we were insistent on using both our leverage and our procurement power uh, to make a difference. And we created a tremendous amount of wealth. Uh, we created a lot of opportunity uh, by doing that. It was not always warmly received by everyone, but I had a conviction and, and, and the people of New Orleans at the time want to change. And so there is a private sector role here. There is a public sector role here. There is a role that small business owners have to meet the moment uh, themselves. Uh, and, and we should not get into a, a finger pointing conversation ever about whose responsibility it is. It's everyone's responsibility because to grow small businesses is to produce jobs and economic growth for everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Mark Madrid, <laughs> would love to get your thoughts, uh, building off uh, Mark and also Felicia. Sure, great afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, it has to start with thank you. Thank you to all the entrepreneurs that are out there for your time today. I hope you can hear it from my heart. Uh, uh, you have choices with your precious time during the pandemic and recovery. So thank you for your precious time here. Of course, I have a lot of thank yous and I'll do those later be, for those who made this happen in the first place. Uh, I wanna say that, first of all, wow. Uh, thank you for, if you have an event that's focused on small business owners, you should feature small business owners. So I don't know about you, but I was absolutely just riveted to that panel. Thank you, uh, Hyman, Tawanda, Jane Lee, Kim, for those insights. I want you to know that here at the SBA that we hear you. And I am so excited to be here uh, on behalf of President Biden, Vice President Harris, and our amazing SBA administrator, Isabel Guzman. I can only uh, speak to you from the heart first is that your persistence is notable during COVID-19 and it's always powerful to relate to it. And I can share that I do relate to it. I lost my dad to COVID-19 and I almost lost my mother and my sister was positive. This was back in the summer of 2020. So it was one of those stories that you heard about and it was tough. The way I can relate to you is my dad was a business owner. He opened up his welding business in the Texas Panhandle that he owned for over 40 years. I wouldn't be here today. I'm pinching myself that I'm working for the people, my ultimate dream, especially for small businesses, but I'm dedicating my work here around the clock to my father and all the entrepreneurs that are out there. And in this case, 45 plus. What I can tell you is that the lessons learned is that these gaps that existed before, which are gaps in terms of access to capital, access to people, access to resources, access to services, access to everything, fill in the blank, including networks. We're magnified during this pandemic. And so what do we do about it? Well, this administration is doing something about it when it comes to solutions. And within the first 100 days, when it comes to COVID-19 related resources, you've, hit, you've seen enhancements, in the PPP program. You've seen a cap raise in the idle loan program. Now these are all technicalities, but we need to go further in terms of business owners, bringing it to your level, being connected on the ground, realizing what's happening to you, that you're making decisions that you don't know what's gonna happen the next month. You don't know if you're gonna have your payroll around next week. So we have to bring it to you. And uh, we're excited under the American Rescue Plan that we're launching a navigators program, uh, uh, program, a pilot. All that means is we gotta be connected to the ground. And thank you for your introduction earlier. The, my, my former job was at the Latino Business Action Network where we had that concept. It's now the CEO is Jennifer Garcia, but we had that concept to fight a ground war, meaning that you know every inch of the terrain when it comes to small business owners, not to be speaking at them from the atmosphere, not to understand why they have caution tape on their bathroom, not to under, 
to be able to understand that they have 10 or 25% capacity inside. To you restaurant owners, relief is on the way with the Restaurant Re Revitalization Fund and grant opportunity coming through the Amer American Rescue Plan. I hope you can see it in my eyes, um, in my expressions, in my heart, that we are here to serve you. And we always gotta remember that that's our goal at the SBA. So I look forward to this discussion. I'm delighted to be with these panelists and to see this chatter is just amazing. Keep it going. And I do wanna recognize CDFIs. I see that in the chatter. They have been a powering force uh, behind getting some PPP loans into the hands of our small business owners. And so thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. And thank you so much, Mark, for being able to join us and our thoughts are with you and your family. Uh, Chris. Uh, thank as, you. Yeah. As president of uh, JP. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, thank you again. Uh, let me add my thank yous to all the thank yous before um, to the to the participants, um, to the panelists, um, <laughs> particularly panelists before. Um, it's already hard enough to sort of um, answer your question after my co-panelists thoroughly answered in every possible way um, everything we might have learned um, through the pandemic. And so I'm going to try to say something, a little bit of something here. Um, but in particular, after the panelists before, um, it's really was amazing to kind of hear your perspective and to hear that voice. And I think it's incredibly important. And I don't know what I can add to, to what's already been said about making sure that we pay attention to that. And also, Mark, you called out the chatter, which has been fabulous. And so my eyes are trying to pay attention to the conversation. Um, and I've also got my eyes on what people are saying over there in the chat because it's really, really um, in, in, invigorating. So um, please continue that. I think the only thing I would add to, to what's already been said is, um, the gaps absolutely um, were expanded through the pandemic in all the ways that everybody else already mentioned. Um, and I think the only thing I would add to that, and I just thought it was really fascinating, this isn't, this isn't on our own research so much as it is on the Fed piece that just came out, um, was to see the gap expanding in particular for the, for the 45 plus entrepreneurs, um, which was interesting, I a really interesting intersection um, between age and, and race in particular, right? So. Um, uh, we, we have seen in our research and many people have seen um, in other pieces of research, all of the, the challenges and sort of uh, differential opportunities um, black and brown entrepreneurs face. Um, for older entrepreneurs, uh, one of the uh, um, tremendous advantages they bring to being an entrepreneur is they have experience. Um, they have had an opportunity to build customer bases um, and they've had an opportunity in, in many cases to build wealth. And they, these are things that are super important, like having the customers having the capital um, that Mark uh, mentioned um, are what we see as like some of the most important things. And so uh, I am not surprised that the majority of entrepreneurs are 45 plus and the majority of successful entrepreneurs are, are 45 plus. And because of all the, the, the time and experience that you have to bring to your business, it's really important. Um, and then to see that we lost more of them over the last year or so, um, is just heartbreaking because like that's where so much of the contribution was coming from. So I think the thing to, to pay attention to is to make sure that we do everything we can to support um, 45 plus entrepreneurs, particularly black and, and brown ones, um, because they were just making such an important contribution and to see that uh, the way that the pandemic hit those businesses was harder still, I think is just uh, a real, miss, right? If, especially if we don't do something about it through policy. And so I think that's the, the main thing I want to focus on in terms of incremental things to, to what this already <laughs> robust panel has brought to this conversation. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. I want to pick up on something that Mark Morrell indicated in his opening remarks. And uh, he basically called it the four C's, that you need capital, you need connections, you need uh, contracts, and you need customers. Uh, and we also heard from Mark Madrid in terms of the role of the uh, public sector and the role that the Small Business Administration is playing to really bring that much needed relief. And this is a question for everyone on the panel, is this whole idea, as, as Mark Morrell indicated, is that we all have a responsibility to close these equity gaps. Uh, that it's not just one sector alone that can actually solve it. So Chris, I'll start with you. What are the opportunities to close these equity gaps and how can we work from a multi-sectorial perspective to really address this moment in time? Yeah, that's a great question. And look, I think there's, um, it's a hard problem, right? It's like moving, moving capital around is, is <laughs> whole sectors dedicate, you know, sort of lots and lots of resources to that. And so I don't want to understate the, the difficulty in, in doing that. Um, but I would say pr 
particularly for um, both the federal government and I, uh, you will know that a lot of interest in not just the federal government, but also state and local governments uh, who may have a unique opportunity over the, over the next year to, to really play more here than they have in the past to by understanding where the needs are greatest, um, really to, to focus uh, whatever programs they can do in the capital space to the small businesses that need it the most. Um, I do worry that there are ongoing narratives in aggregate that are about um, the places that focus on the places where the small business sector has already gotten lots of capital. And, and it is true that there are many businesses that are doing having their best year ever. And, and I, I celebrate that, right? I'm very happy to see when businesses have been successful. Um, but I just want to make sure, and I think it's important for you know at least those sectors um, and sort of, again, sort of federal and state uh, local governments uh, to not just hear those stories and, and support that success, but really to understand how you might target in a very um, sort of micro-targeted way capital support in particular to the industries, to the personal services businesses uh, that have really, you know, sort of been impacted by a lot of the, you know, stay at home homeowners and people just um, behavioral inclinations to, you know, not go out when there's a pandemic, which I think is a, you know, an understandable response to those black and brown entrepreneurs and to those communities uh, uh, where, you know, historically, and I think in the current moment we see increasing sort of pull away in terms of people going to the businesses and servicing the businesses in those areas. So I think that's a, the biggest thing that you could really sort of lean on would be the, the targeting and the focus. I think, you know, for whatever resources we can put against it, making sure that it's money well spent would be what I would suggest. Thank you, uh, Chris. Policia, thoughts? Um, I think that one of the things is, um, you know, how, how we look at small businesses, right? We have to understand that a, a small business is going to go through different levels from startup to emerging to second stage, you know, all the way, hopefully getting to large. And as the businesses are going through this transition is understanding the services that are being offered by the government, by SBA, by any of the CDFIs, you know, where the business is and the needs that they have, because each one is going to have different needs. Um, the, the second stage is, is really much the, the business owner that's already gone through the trials and error. They've gone through the school of hard knocks. They've, they've learned their lessons already, right? They're already establishing themselves in, in a more, um, you know, uh, thought process, right? The emerging, man, they're just taking off. They're trying to get as much as they can to get their flag out there so people can see them. And they want that repeat client coming in, right? The startup is kind of figuring out what I'm going to sell. What am I, you know, what am I good for? And, you know, when they land that first repeat client, that's something that they can easily say, wow, I, I, I did it. Okay, now I have a product or service that I can start marketing. And that is something that I think a lot of the times the programs come out and they're one size fits all. And it really doesn't work, right? We saw that during the PPP approach. It didn't work for everybody. And they're like, we have all this money for small business. Well, who took advantage of it? It was the levels that, that were more established, but having the programs established for the different levels is very important. Having the training available for the different levels is very important. Um, having the access to capital at those levels is also important. Um, the One of the things that we like to talk about at the Maestro Center here in San Antonio is that we work our ecosystem, we bring it together, we work together. We never say they do this and we do that. We all are good at something, we bring it together and it helps that entrepreneur. But we also have to work with the agencies that are giving out those contracts. We go back and ask them, what do you need to make sure you're giving more contracts to small business? Let us do the training, so let us connect them, let us do the networking, so that is not separate. It should be something that happens and they're constantly talking. The buy local programs for our, you know, at the city, the state, the federal level, that has to happen across the board, but it cannot happen at 5%. It has to happen at 50% to make an impact, right? And we have to have our government and leadership that support those kind of programs um, or it never, it will never happen. And it's one thing to say a private owner is going to say, I'm gonna do it. It's one thing to say we're paying public taxes money and that money is not staying within the same by local program and it should. Um, the other thing I think is that when we um, are talking about programs for small business, have small business at the table because they're going to tell you what's gonna work and what isn't 
but you need to have them at different levels. Remember, the other thing is having the agencies that are serving the small businesses already, their boots on the ground, get them engaged right away. It, we don't need government to create another department internally to try to funnel this money. That should never happen because they're so disconnected. We need the agencies that are already working, connecting with the businesses to be supported. The incubation centers, the nonprofits that are working with these small businesses need support. We need government to look at them and say, hey, what do you need to serve more businesses? Instead of saying, oh, no, no, you're, you're not going to do this. We're going to do it separately. And that's a mistake. Those are lessons learned that need to happen. And the reality is that right now, everybody's talking about there's going to be a lot of funding coming in for small businesses. It's going to be limited funds because small businesses need more than that. They need more than a one-time fix. They need support that is established that stays on with them to continue establishing their businesses. They need loans that are not going to be high interest, right? The CDFIs are there to serve, but they're also should be there to serve with low interest. Even they're coming in at high interest because it's high risk. I mean, give me a break. When are we going to say, hey, we're going to support it because it's the right thing to do and it's going to stay local. Those things need to happen and, and we need it to happen now. Thank you. Mark Morial. Yeah, let me let me focus. I want to I want to make two points. Uh, one, I think it bears noting why the PPP uh, was problematic from the start. And it was problematic from the start because when the Trump administration designed PPP, its aims on the top line were laudable. We're going to create relief for small businesses such that no employees would have to lose their jobs. However, when they designed the program, the definition of a small business was any business with 500 employees or less. They took the SBA size guidelines, which had been respected and honored throughout uh, the country for years and years and years and tossed them in the garbage can. They didn't use the SBA definition of what a small business is, which as you know, has definitions which differ from sector to sector in terms of revenues, in terms of the number of employees. That was a failure from the start. The reason why I point this out is because in the design of public policy, uh, there's got to be a conversation with the people that the public policy is designed to impact. Mm. Number two, they said, we are going to exclude the owner operator businesses from benefiting from this. This is for your employees. It's not for you. Not understanding the data that demonstrated that uh, 8.5 million businesses in America, 4.5 million small, average number of employees for a small business, regardless of race, five employees, Black and Latinx businesses, anywhere from 80 to 90% of them, one employee. So the people that designed it, frankly, didn't know what they were doing because they didn't talk to anybody. They talked to themselves. They looked at it the way they looked at it. And then they created an incentive for the banks so that the bigger the loan, the bigger the fee thereby incentivizing the banks to make larger loans versus smaller loans. These are design defects in the policy, in the program. The minute I saw these design defects, I shared with my allies uh, in Congress, mostly Democrats, that this was a defect in the design of the program. Fast forward. The Biden administration, during the transition, uh, worked with a number of us and came out with a number of, if you will, patchwork fixes to try to make PPP a whole lot better. And I give them credit for trying to take the flawed design and do the best they can with it. Now, what would help today? I tell you one thing that would help the CDFI industry 
is if the CDFIs could get inexpensive capital. Most CDFIs have to basically borrow money from a bank or financial institution after the bank is marking up whether it's the source of capital is from their own deposits or whether it's from the Fed, they mark it up and lend it to the CDFI. And then the CDFI is gonna mark it up and lend it to its own customers. If we could find a way to get 1% money to the CDFI community, if we could lower the cost of capital for the CDFI community, the perception is, is that these loans are more risky. The reality is, is that they're not. Because this is what happens. If you're a big lender, big borrower, and you get in trouble with your loan, what does the bank do? They restructure your loan, flatten out the payments, work with you. They want to avoid the default. They're not interested in calling the loan. If you're a small business lender, you've signed a personal guarantee, you get behind on your payment, bam, you go into collections. And there's really no meaningful effort. That's a cultural change that has to occur. So I point out that we need to, if CDFIs, which we have one of the National Urban League, which we support, which there needs to be much more capacity to lend to small businesses, are going to be uh, a method to address the capital issues, then what we need to do is find reforms, I'll call it, to how CDFIs are funded so that they can get a lower cost of capital and thereby pass on that capital to the people they lend to at a much lower rate. That to me would be a distinct, a distinct if you will, step in the right direction. Remember, CDFIs are not 30 years old, 40 years old, almost 50 years old, 40 to the 70s, right? We got to update. We can't use 19, 20th century mentality, a 20th century mindset to solve 21st century problems. Thank you for that, Mark. Mark Madrid. Well, thank you, Mark, for your passion, Julissa as well, and Chris with your reflections and uh, I'd like to bring it back to what we're trying to do right now, uh, considering that we're in this pandemic. And so thank you for your viewpoints uh, noted. Uh, business owners who are out there are wondering, what can we do right now? So I always like to think about in these virtual settings, because you might be running your independent school district or caring for a loved one or thinking about your employees or when you're gonna come back and restore operations at a full capacity, you might be thinking about your vaccine, help is here. And so I'd like to talk about the, uh, my office, the Office of Entrepreneurial Development, which oversees the network of small business development centers, women's business centers, and score chapters across the country. There's 62 uh, lead centers for the SBDC, uh, which is a small business development center and there's over 900 service centers across the country. There's 135 women's business centers and over 10,000 SCORE mentors across the country. So how do you access that? Well, one takeaway, because I think about takeaways and respect to you, like coming out of this deal, what is something that you can have as a deliverable? So thank you, PPS and uh, AARP. I'd like to mention that Small Business Resource Center because I just don't plug something without going into it. Right, if you go to this resource center that was mentioned earlier, you'll see under resources that you can go to the SBA to find one of those service centers that I was just describing. And so I hope that you do that um, as well. We are looking very, very hard on uh, making sure that we relay uh, the enhancements that are being made right now. I'll give you one for an example, right? If, if you're a 40 out there, a Schedule C, a Schedule C, we made PPP more accessible for you. How? Where you're able to leverage a calculation that is not based on uh, gross revenues, but net profit. So that bought, uh, brought a little bit of relief uh, for you all. When we're talking about restaurant owners, uh, a service sector that has been hit incredibly hard, as Jane Lee attested to earlier, help is on the way with that. 
So I just, uh, I'm gonna keep my remarks short and sweet in terms of saying, I wanna make sure that you all walk away and go to that, you, that website right now. I hope somebody can repost it, that Small Business Resource Center, that you can reference the SBA resources that are on that center so that you can put in your zip code and go to one of those uh, resources that I just mentioned. I'm so proud to lead uh, this area, the Office of Entrepreneurial Development and all the hard work that is being done every day on the ground. We have more work to do. And so as part of the American uh, Rescue Plan, under my office, we are also launching the Community Navigator uh, pilot. And all that means is we're trying to access those folks that you all mentioned in this panel through proven community advocates that are connected. I come back to being connected to the ground and not the air, meaning you know the terrain. Uh, I saw some uh, chatter earlier about Spanish language services and CDFIs. Uh, I've heard, uh, which I agree with 100%, the uh, relationships, your accountant, you know, legal support, relationships with the band or cap, uh, banker or capital provider. So the bottom line is so many uh, businesses do not have those access points. So that's what we're going to try to remedy uh, through the Community Navigator pilot and the other programs that I mentioned here, as well the shuttered venues is finally getting on the ground and implemented. So a lot of terminology Oh, our job is to make sure that you understand uh, all, all the programs that are out there. I'll close with this. When I was back in my former position, I realized very quickly that there was an appetite for small business owners to want to understand, but we had to do a better job of, of explaining what is the difference between, well, first of all, what is idle, you know, economic injury disaster loan? What is the difference between an idle loan, which is a low interest loan that's amortized over 30 years, with deferred pay, or first payment, what is the difference between an idle loan and an idle grant? What is the difference then with a PPP draw? What are the differences between the Paycheck Protection Program deployed in 2020 and the one deployed in 2021? And then what is the forgiveness? What does that entail? Where are the latest updates? Right there, you have at least five resources. It's our job to make sure that we make that digestible, distillable, and, uh, and, the, and encourage you and give you the confidence to act. So that is our commitment and I'm proud to be here serving you. Thank you. But thank you so much, Mark, for your leadership and for sharing these resources with uh, everyone who's watching right now. Uh, we have about four minutes and I wanna uh, wrap up with this last question. And that is, there's no secret uh, that systemic inequities and some of the discriminatory practices are real barriers, particularly for women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. We saw the data earlier uh, that really showed the devastating impact on minority-owned and women-owned businesses. Uh, we've also heard uh, through the research that was released some of the qualitative uh, insights that were shared by uh, people of color who own um, businesses in terms of some of the barriers that they face. What is the conversation that needs to happen uh, in terms of addressing these systemic issues and what's the cost of doing nothing? And I'm just gonna turn it to uh, Julissa, if you would like to close us out with just your thoughts. What's the cost of doing nothing if we don't address these systemic barriers? Well, um, if we're happy with the way things are today, then do nothing, you know? But if we're not happy with the way things are, if we want better, if we want better communities, if we wanna build the economy, we want better jobs, better paying benefits for, our community, we wanna improve poverty, we gotta to get to work. We got a lot of work to do. We gotta talk about it at all levels of government, not just at the federal, we need it at the state and we need it at the local level and we need to get involved. I think some of the business owners were saying, hey, they were getting involved and they're, they're letting the government know even the services being offered, hey, this doesn't work, but if you do this, this would work. Those are the things that need to happen and and you need to provide the services that are coming even from, you know, some of the agencies, they cannot be so one size fits all, they got to be flexible because they need to be able to be adjusted at the level that they're being served. Um, and if you can develop through the SBA, a program that is tied to mentorship, but that is tied to not a two year program get business owners to volunteer and just give back and give some time to serve and help each other, they will create that networking that needs to happen, right? We just need the gateway to, to produce it. But um, to do nothing, that's, 
that's not even an option we should say is an option. We, we can't do that. Chris? Uh, yeah, you could, it could be the same or it could just be worse. I mean, I, if, if you like the way things are now, you might still want to do something because if you don't do anything, I think, you know, the, the bigger, better resources, businesses are going to continue to sort of leverage those resources to, to, to build their advantage. Right. So it's, yeah, I, I think doing nothing is, is probably worse than sort of leaving things as they are, you know, which is not a great place to start from. I completely agree with you Julius, on that point, but I would just say. It, it could be yet worse than that. And, and that's what I would pay attention to. Mark Morrell, sir. You're on mute, sir. Our world has been rocked uh, as we sit here out of the corner of my eye and watch the trial in Minneapolis. Our world has been rocked as we've seen hatred directed at our Asian American brothers and sisters. Our world has been rocked by watching the events on January 6th at the US Capitol. The status quo is not an option for the nation. The status quo, when it comes to economic empowerment, the wealth gap, the income gap, the racial wealth gap, and the gap between large and small businesses and businesses of color and others, have to be closed. It's an imperative of our times to ignore it, to embrace the status quo and to be afraid of change is simply to usher in more conflict, more division, wider gaps and more challenges for this country. It is simple. It's all ties back to what kind of nation we want to build in the 21st century in America for all America with true economic opportunity. We can't just mouth the words. We can't just talk the talk. We have to walk the walk. Thank you, Mark. And I know that we're pressed for time. So Mark Madrid, you have the final word, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panelists. I mean, the, the passion uh, that you spoke, uh, with which you spoke is, uh, wow. I mean, it's coming from a deep place, a deep place of wisdom. I'd like to bring it back to where I started, which is uh, with my dad. You know, my dad was still two weeks before he got back into the hospital where he went for the final time at 76, was operating a bobcat um, at our family ranch and was, and was selling pipe, was selling pipe on Facebook. Now, when he left this earth, the things that we're talking about here, I wish he would have had more access to capital, more access to resources, more access to networks, low interest rate loans, uh, preserved credit score. What might have been? What might have been is he would have been able to have franchises and this family business could be still surviving. And not only that, but persisting through COVID-19. I'm excited, as President Biden says, to deliver solutions and not create division. And this forum here, to all of you, and I heard about the Native American community here too as well. That's very important to this conversation as well. But if we're talking uh, 45 plus, socially and economically disadvantaged, we're talking BIPOCs, our sensitivity to the Asian business community as well during this time period. We're talking about the LGBTQ community all of us together and rural business owners. And for that matter, white business owners who have been disadvantaged in underserved territories. It's time for us to think about our commonality. And uh, there's, a, there's a mantra that we had at the Latino Business Action Network where I previously served. Do business with each other, get business for each other and promote each other. And so, with all that too, what they've started to do, and I see you doing it here, and what these folks said here, my dear friends, is rise up. We're at an inflection point and it's the right atmosphere to rise up and make your voices be known. Thank with that you. said, I'm just very thankful to AARP, PPS, and all the panelists and presenters today. And a special shout out to Felicia. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you for being you. with us.